Okay, so before we dig into how nature does construction, I wanted to take a few just glimpses at what we do in terms of construction. And, you know, I feel like we always look at the really beautiful examples like the Golden Gate Bridge or, you know, various skyscrapers in Dubai or the pyramids or whatever. But the things that really get me tend to fall under a category I refer to as decrepitude. And this is another thing that when I'm traveling around the world, I'm always like, yeah, where's nature taking stuff back? And what structures do we have that like withstand the, the test of time? And I think, you know, as humans, we are builders. It's like written into our DNA. Um, and I think there's also something about exploration and also like nature taking things back that you know, probably a lot of you are really like intrigued by as well. So alongside the beauty of a gleaming new building, like I also just find so much interest in some of these bizarre, this is the, uh, again, that structure in Turkey, Cappadocia, Dokia, I'm not sure how to say it. Um, like just the variety that we have is incredible. And I see a lot of you are, yeah, abandoned buildings just hit different. They do. There's so many that I follow. Um, accounts that I follow on Twitter, where I just love it. So like, this is an example in uh, Anchor Watt, I think this is Anchor Tom, um, where you can see these are banyan trees, which we'll talk about, I think, next week. And it just, it fills me with so much inspiration and it gets that sort of childlike glee that I have to be like, oh, I wanna like climb around in there. Uh, I know those roots, right? Oh, it's amazing. So I think that one of the things that I think about is, like how do nature's designs compare to our own and what does upkeep look like? Like if we were gonna keep all of these structures looking polished and pretty and whatever, um, like how much effort does that take and how many chemicals does that take? And like, if we look at nature and how nature upkeeps their structures over time, like that's a whole different perspective. And then we start thinking about like, the idea of life creating conditions conducive to life. So like, you know, life is making, you know, areas with more humidity or more shade or little microclimates that then incur all of these other, this like cascade of other things that can exist there. And I just love to see when our structures are abandoned and to see how life can just spring so quickly out of that. So then that naturally kind of leads me to, well, what if, you know, the whole point of biomimicry, what if it wasn't like our building or nature being like, I'm taking this back. Like, what if we could live in an avatar like world? What if our cities looked like this? Like how amazing would it be if like, this is like what we got to go into. And these were, you know, our buildings and not just like incredible, beautiful alien biology. What if it wasn't one or the other? So that's kind of the lens that I take when I'm looking at this stuff. <laughs> uh, I know I'm really excited for Avatar 2 and 3 as well. It's been too long. Okay, so now if we go back to New Orleans for a second and those, those live oaks, I just want to do a really quick recap on some of the down and dirty stuff so that we can kind of compare going back and forth. What are our designs? How does nature take over our designs? How does nature actually design and see if we can come full circle? Um, I know a lot of you said on Monday that you also kind of fell into the, the rabbit hole with this, especially for me looking at the issues of uh, formaldehyde and those FEMA trailers and emergency housing, like all oh, that stuff really made me angry. It's like, um, I don't know if you guys uh, follow any <laughs> beauty in chemistry news, but years ago, there was this huge controversy over nail polish because there was a ton of formaldehyde in nail polish and the European Un Union, EU, had completely different regulatory boards. And so like we say, oh, there's these few chemicals we won't use and we're just not gonna test everything else. It's too expensive. But the EU is like, no, 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 no. Like you can't have this one or this one or this one. It's a huge list. And so there's all sorts of companies like Revlon, whatever, that will make one product for us that's cheaper and another product for those in Europe that has less crap in it because that's what they are required to do. So it's like, we know that formaldehyde is a problem even down to something as, as simple as uh, formaldehyde. Um, I'm sure you guys read about that. It's like a huge carcinogen. It can create extreme headaches and nosebleeds and respiratory infections and death, especially you know in, in children and the elderly and people with underlying conditions. <laughs> Same thing goes for fast food menus. Yeah, dude, don't even get me started. 
Um, and I'm sure you guys saw, you know, where, where this wood is taking place um, within the, the, uh, the plywood and stuff, which we'll come back to in just a second. Um, I think for me, aside from just like the chemical um, body burden of all of this stuff is just the ethics violations. Uh, you know, how some people were living in these structures for years after, or they sold them to, you know, places in one of the Dakotas who had an oil boom. And then, you know, they became beyond temporary housing or they sell them to the natives of the land there. And like the government just stops the testing because they know it's a problem and they don't want the data. So they go, okay, we're just not going to like look at this anymore. And we're just going to like hide our heads and put some stickers over stuff and pretend that everything's fine. Like that to me, that's, that's what gets me like so fired up about this stuff. It's not just because I love to go scamper around and find the coolest tree in the forest. Um, but it's also because this ethics stuff really just infuriates me. Um, anyway, so um, just for those of you that are not familiar with uh, laminates and plywoods and particle boards and all this stuff, that formaldehyde is serving as an adhesive. It's serving as a glue, uh, which makes all these little bits and pieces of boards uh, stick together and maintain stronger integrity despite being kind of junk material. I'm not going to go into that too much. The other thing that really gets to me is where else we find formaldehyde. And I just alluded to this a second ago. Um, I'm sure when some of you read this immediately, you thought about like dissections and uh, the idea of it being a preservative instead of an adhesive. And that's definitely true, but we see it in, oh my gosh, all of the, all of our like body products are not regulated. So whether it's your deodorant or your lipstick or whatever, those terms like natural or what, like they don't mean anything. None of that stuff means anything. Nobody is looking out for that stuff and saying this is safe. So we find things like formaldehyde in flooring and fibers, like almost all of the clothing that we are wearing is synthetic fibers, which means there's formaldehyde in there. And what they do, that formaldehyde lends itself to like better flexibility. Um, and so, yeah, we can wash it a bunch of times and eventually like those little particles get out of there and um, our bodies can, you know, break some of these things down, but it's, it's all over the place. And so you might ask yourself, all right, like if, if this stuff is in everything from my clothing to my eyelash glue, if those of you, uh, any of you, any of you use eyelash glue, why is it that we aren't all sick? Well, there's this ancient, I'll say dead Greek guy, Paracelsus, and he came up with this phrase ages ago. And he said that the dose is what makes the medicine versus the poison. So if we have a little bit of formaldehyde that's coming from one or two sources, our bodies can break that down and we're fine. But if you've got these people living in these trailers for extended periods of time, um, and then you know maybe another person uses it and another after that, and the off-gassing is getting stronger, but then you also have all of these other things, well, now the dosage is just too strong. And it goes from being, you know, something that's, you know, benign on a tiny, tiny level to hugely detrimental. And actually, um, in terms of sign language, I don't know if any of you know that's. I'm just gonna put my face up here for just one more second. If the um, the sign for medicine and poison is like you put your hand up and you use your middle finger and you do for poison, medicine's the same thing. You just change your facial expression. So like this idea is all over the place. Okay, so we know it's an adhesive. We know it's a massive problem, especially in underserved populations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Paracelsus quote is something like the dose makes the poison and something like that. So let's now look at an organism we might turn to to say, all right, how do we get rid of this adhesive? Uh, our population is going to continue to go up, and we also need cheap materials to make, you know, really quick housing for people uh, experiencing these huge examples of dynamic non-equilibrium because they're not going away. So, muscles are one of the strongest champions of adhesion 
that we have. So let's look at this for just a second. Why is it that muscles have to be able to stick to something? Waves, tide, where do they live? What do we call that ecosystem? Intertidal. Yeah, it's the intertidal zone. So that means that they are experiencing huge fluctuations of water, wind, sunlight, salinity, desiccation, all of these things that we are also going to be looking at for this challenge. Um, they are largely sessile organisms, which means that they cannot scamper up and escape either the, the, you know, the sunlight or the crashing waves. But also let's think about the substrate that they are on. When you find a muscle that's attached to something, what is it that they're attached to? Yeah, they literally stick to anything, yeah. So, and, and as Colin pointed out, rock. So when we think about adhesion, a lot of times we're thinking about like a flat surface to a flat surface. In the case of particle board, we don't have perfectly flat surfaces. We've got some texture in there. And, you know, if you were ever a kid playing with like felt or crafts or whatever, you know that sometimes when we have pitted surfaces and we try to glue things together, we need a much stronger glue because it doesn't like there's it doesn't know how to grab on to some of those things. So the operating conditions are things that uh, make sense to us. They're relevant biotic factors and abiotic factors that are happening here. Um, and we know we need a really strong adhesive without, without it being toxic, which is probably the most important thing. So let's just get a quick sense of anatomy here. So here are the blue muscles. You can see them all clumped together in their intertidal glory. And if I look a little closer, I'm starting to see something going on here. So muscles, as it turns out, can't move. There's not very much. And if you've noticed, they have these tiny little anchors right here. So what are these? What do they do? Well, let's go to what we know about spiders real quick. We know that spider webs are incredibly strong. We know that they form in ambient temperatures. They don't have to superheat anything. What are they made of? Any idea? So most generally speaking, they're protein based and the proteins are so uh, complex that we have a hard time mimicking them. Um, but it makes sense that sometimes these, these tiny little fibers that might have properties that help with attachment. So it's completely different in the spider web, but there is some sort of similarities in um, the muscles as well. So muscles are also secreting really complex proteins that form these threads, which we call bissel threads. Now, if you've ever thought of like the word abyss, you know, that's, that's referring to like the deep dark ocean. So if you kind of kind of keep that ocean sort of idea in your mind, you can see right here, these are the bissel threads. Again, think of it being like your little, your little super Spider-Man stuff going on. So let's orient ourselves to some anatomy for just a second. So here we've got the whole thing. Now these are gastropods, which means, you know, foot moving. And this little thing is what we refer to as the foot. If we pretend this was a real foot, imagine where the ankle would be. And that's kind of where within the muscle where the bissel threads are made and will extend out of this thing. Um, so here's what that looks like. So part of this foot thing, which is what you just saw kind of poking out, is this little piece called the stem. And there's a gland in there that makes this liquid protein. Um, when the proteins touch water, they immediately harden. 
They go from these stretchy fluid little things to being an incredibly strong thread. And I think what makes me so amazed with this is like, this is the opposite of what mucus does. And I'm obsessed with mucus. And so the fact that it can go either way, like makes me just, it makes my brain burst because in mucus, you have this tiny little mucin, it's excreted. And then you get all of this sort of super flexible slime that's still really, really strong, but it's not hardening. It's like becoming gelatin. So it's the same idea. We're still using proteins, but the, you know, what it forms after that is just completely different. It's amazing. So it's like anti-mucus. So cool. Okay. So what do they do with it? Well, as we mentioned earlier, they attach to damn near anything, rocks, concrete, other muscles, the sides of ships, everything. Well, why do they need to attach to this stuff? While well, they're living in the intertidal zone, they can't move too much. They need stability. Um, they also want to attach to each other. Well, why would that be? Why might they want to attach to each other? Yep, stronger bonds, more the merrier. Harder for predation. Yep, reproduction, that's a huge one for sure. More surface area, that's all great. Higher surface area also means that they can slow down some of those waves a little bit better. Also, safety in numbers. That gets a little bit to what Jade was just talking about. They're also sharp. Like you don't wanna climb over this thing because it's like a lot of little knives going on there. So again, we get back to this idea of the operating conditions. Because it's intertidal, we have all these cycles. We've got full sun, we've got beating waves. This is going on nonstop. There's predators all over and different ones are happening at different times, depending on if you are exposed to sunlight or if you're underneath the water. It's a constantly changing, completely nutso environment. And so that makes it perfect for us if we are going to study uh, you know, examples of dynamic non-equilibrium to use an organism like this. Now, when they're little, like an inch long, little teeny little guys, they use these as climbing ropes. So they'll extend them, attach them, and then shorten them and pull them. And they can kind of like wiggle and move, move themselves. And so this is also something that's fascinating and we don't often see with anything that's adhesive in our world is that they're super elastic. They're stretchy. And that gets back to what Wyatt was saying a minute ago. This idea of flexibility providing for strength is huge. They're elastic. That means they're not brittle. They can stretch. These little buggers can stretch out 150 times their length. And they're five times stronger than our tendons. So the medical implications alone there are huge. Now, as they're adults and they're not moving as much, um, if the waves are really slamming them, like let's say we're in a storm, they can purposefully arrange these little threads and regenerate more. Those threads will absorb the tension and reduce the load and they can keep the muscles safe. So they can kind of decide which way that they're sort of shifting in or out of the waves. And again, they're springy, they're flexible, they're strong, that keeps them safe. Um, once they're too big, to, to like move too much, then they just permanently attach themselves. And from time to time, they'll grow new strings, but they're not like little anymore. So they're kind of a little bit more stuck. So there's a reason you hear about zebra mussels being so invasive. It's because like, once you get them on there, those bissel threads are tough. So let's look at it in a little bit more depth. So the bissel thread really has three parts here. Um, so I've got them you know, just sort of zooming up and zooming up and now we're looking at the thread and like kind of this little attachment piece. This is, I've just oriented it the same way so this diagram's upside down, but this is like the muscle. Um, here we've got, you know, where this thread is coming out and then this is the substrate, which would be, you know, the rock or the ship or whatever. So this first ropey sort of grooved section um, is super collagen-y which makes sense. That's what allows, you know, the faces of the youth to be supple and strong and flexible and hydrated, etc. And then you'll notice, oh, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. He says, here they build on each other so much they eventually detach from their original anchor. And then there's just a rolling ball of muscles flopping up and down the beach. That sounds like something from a horror movie. I dig it. All right, so we've got this collagen-y sort of thing. It stretches out and forms this sort of fan-like shape, which you can kind of see those like little surface attachment points there. 
And then on the tip here, and you can see there's some different shapes on here, a little foam, an adhesive foam is, is created at the end of this. And that allows it to attach to this substrate. And then the shape itself, this little sort of thing, that's this like spatula, we called it with the gecko. You see this in flies, you see this in bristle threads, this idea all over the place. So we've got multiple things going on. We have the stretchy, elastic nature here, which allows for, you know, some movement and absorption of forces and anti-brittle, da, da, da. We have this area down here where I am also um, putting something out that can uh, sort of fill in some of these little spaces a little bit and attach. Then I have this shape, this almost suction cuppy little shape as well that allows it to sort of be flexible and get around to surfaces that are irregular. So there's like a whole bunch of different things going on there. Okay, so here's another example of kind of what that looks like. This Bissell plaque is what is that sort of foam that is um, forming at the bottom. Here's this little stem, here's the foot, and here's your substrate. All right, so what makes these so cool? Well, first of all, the glue is forming underwater most of the time. And if you think about our glues, if we put them underwater, like that's going to fall apart a lot of the times. Um, or, you know, like I'm sure you guys saw the woman who put like Gorilla Glue in her hair. Like it's, it's either it doesn't stick very well or it sticks so well that it's actually a problem. Uh, in those cases, though, to make those glues, we need a ton of heat, usually, and a ton of toxic chemicals, which leads to off-gassing. We don't have that here. They're, they're just like in the cold ocean. There's nothing going on there. They're using materials directly from their environment. They don't have to travel half across the world to find something. They're water resistant. Most of our glues are like, you know, they get diluted. They fail in water. These obviously don't. And most importantly, most interesting, interestingly to me, is again, our glues don't work well if there's dirt, if there's something irregular, if there's something porous, things just kind of fall apart. So this could be really useful. Now, as just a side note, some muscles have iron within their bristle threads and they create this dense cross-linking within there. So like they're literally metal, like rock on, amazing, super cool. Um, moving on. Just a, you know, maybe this is a do not do this humans before the pandemic even hit some people uh, collect bristle threads and they move things out of them. Maybe not the best use of bristle threads. Anyway, so can we vanquish the use of formaldehyde? Can we use glue muscles and their different components to create something stretchy and strong and flexible that does well under harsh conditions? Oh yes, we can. So one, some of you, maybe up to three of you might be looking for this case study and you'll have to look at who made that, what that company does, what it's looking for. And that will be something that um, maybe you get into. So that's case study number one. Well, let's look at some other aspects of construction and kind of recap what we looked at on Monday. What's the problem? Well, why are buildings demolished? They outlive their purpose, they're too broken. And that leads to just like, ridiculous amounts of waste. Um, you know, in the US alone, we've got more than two times the amount of whatever we throw away per year, just like us in our homes, more than two times that is like the industrial waste from construction. Um, you know, our landfills can already be seen from space, you know, it's not like the wall of China, it's landfills. Um, we also know that like, a lot of time when the materials are delivered to a site, they're not being used all the time. There's like something like 15% that like just gets damaged from like weather or oversights or errors or like people stealing it or, you know, the conditions change or whatever. And so like, that's like if you had a $500 paycheck and you lost $75 to taxes, like that's kind of an analogy for what's happening with construction for like every building. So like principle style, well, we're not recycling all materials. Um, we still have like centralized leadership in a lot of these places that are making those decisions. So then they're not adapting to changing conditions. So that's a problem. We also don't see decentralization. We see all these huge buildings that maybe if they can't be repurposed or they're too far gone, we have to destroy the whole thing instead of having lots of smaller modular pieces. 
Um, so we've got like a lot of ideas of where the life's principles are falling. Well, do we have any good ideas? So I went on Google and I just typed in like buy modular housing. And so, okay, what if we made lots of smaller structures? Can we do that? Sure. And you can see on there, you know, you can buy yourself a little house for, you know, a couple thousand dollars, tiny homes, super cool. One of my closest friends has built a few of these. Um, so on the front end of construction, this is great. I know exactly what I'm building. It's like puzzle pieces. It goes together prefab. I'm not wasting materials. Pretty good. Um, we also see this sort of modular idea. A lot, of, a lot of places in Europe actually do things like this. Uh, I was in Austria a few summers ago, and I saw a lot of buildings that had this sort of modular style to them. But of course, because we're humans, um, even prefab horse, uh, horses, nope, houses have a horrible racist past. So uh, when we actually look back to um, where we got prefab uh, houses for in the first place and the uh, creation of our suburbs, we first have to look at Levittown, New York. So they had a seven square mile tract of like potato onion fields. And so this company um, started putting up all these modular homes, da, 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 just like little mushrooms popping out of the ground. One house every 16 minutes was built. So in terms of like quick housing, pretty safe housing, no waste, small amount of materials, great, 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 great. Well, here's the problem. Post-World War II, we've got like, oh, it's like what? 1940 something, we have these people who lived through the Great Depression. Some of them are still feeling the sting of World War I. So these are going up all over the place. Um, and so people are really excited to like have something positive uh, in their lives and something that's like, you know, America is rebuilding sort of thing. Uh, just as a side note, Henry Ford's idea of the assembly line was instrumental in prefab houses. You know, we've got everything's identical, the whole white picket fence, whatever. So in a really short time, they had 17,000 houses. Uh, it took only $7,000. You can buy your own, American dream, good to go. Only you had to be white to live there. So even if you were a person of color and you fought in one of the wars and you got, um, you know, money from the government to make affordable, make housing more affordable to you, you were not allowed to live in these neighborhoods. So before we even get into redlining or all the other things, like right off the bat, we're just gonna say, nah, you know what? I don't care if you have a loan or not. We're just gonna sweep that on, under the rug because only these perfect happy little things can be for white people. So fun, good job, America. All right, so prefab, it's a good idea provided that we do it right and we are equitable about it. We know we've got some issues with wood, well, now let's look at concrete. Well, pros, super cheap. It can withstand pretty much anything. I spent some time in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we see that even if you have a nuclear event, concrete withstands anything pretty much. Um, and we can make really beautiful shapes with it, which is really interesting. So it's pretty, it can be cool. Um, however, here, let me just show you some examples of that. Like, I don't usually think of concrete as being beautiful. Um, you know, I think about it in like parking garages and stuff, but like it can actually be pretty incredible. So what are our detractors then? Well, if the cement industry was a country, it would be the third largest carbon dioxide emitter in the world, just after the US and China. And I put this little visual up there for you. Um, one of the article authors, I think it was Watts maybe, uh, he said, Japan has the same amount of concrete as America. Why? Well, they're an island. They need seawalls. They need a ton of vertical structures because that land is really scarce. They have nuclear reactors all over the place. Like it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Um, and you may ask, okay, like if concrete isn't actually made from a fossil fuel, you know, what's the problem? Well, the energy it takes to extract it, refine it, process it, transport. I mean, transporting alone, this stuff is so heavy. Um, the energy usage, like you've got to heat this limestone up to like 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit to break it down. And then because limestone is made with carbon, 
all of the carbon that was stored in that limestone is now being released into the air. So we've got the twofer of one, using all this energy to break the stuff down, and two, then it releasing all those carbon sinks back up into uh, the air. Um, so this is hugely, hugely problematic. Um, here's an example of a, a limestone mine. And if you know anything about uh, organisms from long ago and where we got our limestone from, you can also figure out what the environment might have looked like millions of years ago because limestone uh, is largely from animals, which you can explore later if you like. Um, another thing that I thought was really interesting about cement is that, you know, we, we think about the plastic problem that we have. We freak out about those garbage patches that are every, all over every single ocean that we have. Um, so in the past 60 years, the amount of plastic we've put into the world is about 8 billion pounds. The cement industry doesn't take 60 years to do that. It does that every two years. But there's no like charismatic animal we can point out. We can't like show a picture of like a sad sea turtle and be like, oh, look at we're killing stuff. And so there's there's nothing to pull at our heartstrings. There's no cleanup campaign, and that would like that would require dismantling everything, which just produces more waste. So like it's a problem that we can't really get ourselves out of. Um, also, we can't really recycle it because once we do, we actually are downcycling it. It ends up in landfills and some of these things, like it's made out of multiple things or maybe a rebar in there. It's just a, it's a disaster. The other problem is how concrete can lead to flooding. Well, one of its pros is that it's waterproof, but that means it's con is that it's waterproof. It's not permeable, which means as we have more and more category four hurricanes and more rain and more flooding, well, this water has no place to go. There's no place to drain. And so we have more wreckage, more death, more destruction. The levees are breaking, the city's underwater. We've got the sewage system problems, like all of that because of concrete. Um, you know, and so like we see this like everywhere. And it's like, this was just happening this year. You know, <laughs> and this is a problem. It's like, this is where we live. This is where our shipping routes are. This is how we get everything that we need. We're all by the water. So, well, what do we do then? Because we can't just move all of our stuff inland. Well, as I alluded to with Japan, we just say, all right, let's just put a wall up. That'll fix it. Yeah. That's just, that's what we do. Just throw a wall on it. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, okay, they protect us for a little bit. They're made of concrete, all right, so they're not permeable. Um, sometimes they run parallel, so there would be, you know, buildings parallel to the structure here. Um, other times they can kind of go into the water as well, so we can put them at different angles and try to stop sort of the forces from reaching us. So they're not always a wall. Oops. Um, they can also stop our cliffs from like naturally eroding because it's sand and, you know, that's great. But, you know, we're still going to have this. We're still going to have erosion. And it's not just the erosion like right up here on the other side of the seawall. We go, oh, we need seawalls. And you see these big old sandbags here. It's not just this erosion we're looking at. If we move a structure into the water, we still have erosion. Well, where is that happening? Well, think about it. It's like a, if we have a wall, it's a big rectangle. When that wave comes up, think about just basic physics. If it slams into that seawall, well, what's it gonna do? Well, that force is gonna go and come right back. So that means there's equal the amount of force that's now going down. What's down here under the water? Oh, we have more rocks and sand. Okay, so you can imagine that within all of this time, now underneath here, underneath these walls, I'm gonna lose structural integrity. I'm amplifying that wave. And then all of those, you know, rocks and dirt and stuff, those erode away. And then the seawall is swept up and then it can just, these pieces fall over and can be carried back to sea. So great, we can use them for a while. And if they go down, we have to build a new one. We still have this happen. Like it's just, they're not sustainable. 
And on top of not being sustainable, like, you know, they're ugly. Uh, and again, they're gonna need to be bigger, bigger waves, bigger storm surges, more water from the melting ice caps and glaciers. So we're we just gonna build more, better. That uh, doesn't make any sense. So where can we look? Well, if we look at a large scale and we're getting away from materials for a second, we have so many animals who are architects. Um, you know, beavers and caddisflies. If you don't know what a caddisfly, C-A-D-D-I-S fly is, those are amazing, look them up. Weaver birds and shells and mucus, you know, homes and all sorts of stuff. Um, so here's, here's the bower bird. I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with these. Uh, they tend to love blue and they make these beautiful little homes to attract the ladies. We've got birds who make these incredible, beautiful structures and they can also like, uh, you know, regulate the temperature in these things. Um, here is an example of some people who did some experiments with caddis flies and saw what they did with like precious gems. And one of the best architects that we have are coral reefs. So if we think about like just super basic coral reef biology, where is it getting its limestone from? Because we see limestone here again. Well, nature considers carbon dioxide a resource. Um, so the way that plants are sucking carbon into their bodies and making their bodies with it, their sugar, their leaves, or woods, all that stuff is coming from the air. This is true with calcium carbonate as well. So eggshells seashells, it's the carbon. The carbon's what we need, they mix it with calcium, now we have strength. Um, and so what's, what's interesting is like, all of this is broken down by acid, which is why when we see the acidification of the oceans, why this is starting to create massive problems. Um, and that is because more carbon is getting, carbon dioxide is getting in there. So this sort of, you know, double-edged sort of, yes, we need carbon, but we don't want carbon dioxide. So if we think about just reefs for just a second, um, beyond kind of like how they form and how they, you know, they suck in all of this uh, stuff from the water, they build their bodies, they make these polyps, you know, we know the photosynthesis sort of symbiotic thing that's going on there. They also do a lot of really amazing things for us. Um, tourism. Definitely fisheries, we, a ton of the world population gets its food. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. We also sadly see like the pet trade is like really huge here. Um, but one of the biggest ones, obviously, and this is the reason why we're looking at it, look at the texture. Shoreline protection. So all of these little reefs here, and you can look at, look at just not the part that's like the waves here that are hitting. Like look at these sort of large fan-like shapes. And then when you zoom in, we have more fans and then we zoom in and we see even more texture. These shapes face the incoming water. So they're acting as a natural seawall all by themselves while creating an incredible place for organisms to live in biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which promotes resilience. So these aren't like trees that are growing like away from and spiraling away from the wind. They are growing directly into it, which makes them super different than a lot of the organisms we think about. Um, there's an estimated, uh, I want to say it's like somewhere between 30 billion to like $10 trillion dollars of economic value that's just provided by just the shapes. The shapes alone that can slow down all these forces of wind and water alone. Um, so when we're thinking about mimicry, this is also something to consider. It's not just the material. It's not just the process of extracting material from the water that's just there. It's also the shape. And we see that here too. Now, interestingly enough, some of you probably know this, um, you know, eventually some of the, the reefs will break down as they're dispersing that energy. Oh, uh, I was reading one statistic. I said something like up to 97% of just average forces and like basic storms can dissipate from like the shape alone. 90%, 97%. That's insane. So huge, amazing buffer. As these tiny fragments get broken up, they are what turn into our beaches, uh, helped along also by these parrotfish who eat chunks of coral and then they digest them and then they poop them out and then you lay down on that sand. You're welcome. And all these creatures, tons of biodiversity. So mechanical properties, 
their dimensions, the distance away from the shoreline, their shapes, the fact that they grow into the strength of the water, they're perfect storm breaks. Um, metaphorically, they're also a great place to look at in terms of emulation, like symbiosis. How are we cultivating cooperating, cooperative relationships? You know, resilience is built on diversity. How might we run an organization like a reef? What is the flexibility and inclusion that something like this might promote? Think about niches. Uh, we've got so many different spaces. Some are large, some are tiny, some are shifting, some are based on the skeleton, some are, you know, because of the living things growing off of it. So we have the space for really quick reflexive uh, changes here. So, all right, here are another couple case studies that you might um, want to look up. So we're going to come full circle. What if we built, we constructed, instead of using you know, the concrete we're using now and mining for all of that and using this ridiculous amount of energy. What if we built like coral reefs did? What if we used concrete that was made the same way, so the same material? What if we use the same process? And what if instead of putting more carbon dioxide into the air as we made concrete, what if we did what coral reefs do? What if we pulled it out? And why it's saying you just watch a TED talk on this. Awesome. Maybe you can share the link with us later. So there are three super famous case studies, and some of you may sign up for these. I'm not going to tell you their names, but I'm going to give you some hints and some clues right now. So uh, case study number one, there's one company that said, well, can we build cement? Can we make concrete um, the same way that coral does? And they found up, yep, we can. Not only can we, but this company made a net zero carbon footprint. Net zero. That's amazing. So this company figured out how to make cement by absorbing carbon, becoming a carbon sink. And um, they also looked at how the coral reefs do it. Well, coral reefs use um, magnesium ions as kind of their, their sort of starting process with this. And this factory figured out to use magnesium in much the same way um, so that they could be a carbon sink. And um, one of the reasons why they were able to also get to net zero, so this is, this is a little, little like cheating, but it's still important to, to mention, all of their factories are solar powered. So even though in some of these cases, their, their heat doesn't have to go as high as normal because their process is kind of flips itself back and forth um, a little bit more like a coral reef does, but um, to offset that, solar. That's pretty cool. So we have concrete being made the same way that a reef does. All right, here's case study number two. And this one, this one might be my favorite. So there's this company that they first were looking at the problem of reef, reef restoration because we know with like bottom trawling and ghost nets and the pet trade industry and reef bleaching, like there's all these things that are destroying the reefs. And it's like, I don't know if any of you have watched that Chasing Coral um, documentary. That's like, oh, it's like heartbreaking. So this company was looking at like, how do we grow the reefs back? And we know um, that around um, the UAE and like the Red Sea and in the Middle East, we have some reefs there that are better at dealing with heat than anywhere else in the world. And so there's also a lot of places who are studying like what makes these reefs more resilient and what makes them able to withstand these higher temperatures and larger storms. Hmm, maybe we can do something with that. So anyway, this company was like, how do we restore the reefs? How do we regrow them? If the reefs go, like that is a pretty good indicator that we're screwed. So, um, <clears throat> they figured out how to make these frames and they kind of they use a little bit of human ingenuity here and they used metal which is kind of the not so uh biomimetic portion of this but the process of how they grew the coral and then created this whole habitat is stunning and beautiful and isn't just for <clears throat> the fish and the biodiversity, but again, this idea of shoreline protection, this idea of bringing back tourism and fish for the local people. It's not just ecosystems because we're all a bunch of hippies who like fish and moray eels. It's also doing huge services for humans. Instead of building giant stupid seawalls, they're gonna fall over eventually and look real ugly. 
So that's the second example. So keywords there would be like coral reef restoration, regrowing um, <clears throat> coral, and that the idea of it having like a metal brace is going to help you there. Some really cool pictures of what that looks like. Oh, hope in humanity. Now the third company, and there's actually, there's a whole bunch of companies that do this, but there's one in particular who's like massively great at this. So a third company tied all these three problems together. They said, all right, <clears throat> we know we're still gonna have seawalls. We're still gonna have places um, where water and land interface like marinas. Um, <clears throat> the cost of sea level rising is something like $14 trillion per year, per year by 2100. So like we gotta do something. So what if <clears throat> we made concrete like a coral reef does? And what if we created shapes similar to the shapes that nature has created? In this case, they are not using coral um, geometry, but mangrove geometry, which you looked at on Monday. What if also we could um, attract more organisms to live there? So how do we use the shape in kind of a flat form? So this is a little bit less about the process of the concrete or like regrowing a whole ecosystem, but like how do we optimize and make something like this, which has no life to something like this. And you can see even on this like little tile here, we are going to form like really beautiful communities of all sorts of different organisms. I think this one's in Australia. I think Volvo might've actually had something to do with it. And I think they have like a really beautiful commercial. Um, so like, this is pretty easy. This is modular. You could build this anywhere and it's, you know, still a seawall, but it's a step in the right direction. All right, so let's kind of zoom back to where we were in the first place. So <clears throat> from Monday to today, we talked about a handful of champions, wetlands, mangroves, live oaks, blue mussels, and coral reefs. What do all of these things have in common? Energy dissipation, yep. We've got complex shapes that are spreading that energy out for sure. What else? What are my operating conditions? Yes, they live colonially. Good. That's great. So we have we don't have just have one muscle, we have a whole ton. We don't just have one polyp of a coral reef, we have a ton. We don't just have one mangrove tree. Highly biodiverse. So Austin just pointed out the ecosystems support life and within there, their systems. So the blue mussel, we're looking at a, communi a community, we're looking at a population, we're looking at not just the mussel, but all the other mussels. And then, you know, the things like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the starfish and some of those other things that live there in tandem, we're looking at a system. So when we're thinking about how we're going to emulate these things, we want to play with this idea of scale. Because it might be that we're looking at the shapes and the geometry of the whole system, and it's not just the process or something created by one individual organism. If we go back to operating conditions for a second. Why do these make the most sense if we are looking at hurricanes? Why these ecosystems? Right. Joseph pointed out one piece. They're all in water or have something to do with a lot of water. What else? Yep, they're all resilient and that's part, partially because it's a system. We've got lots of different organisms working in tandem. Mm -hmm. The energy thing, they're the subject to a lot of dynamic non-equilibrium right there. So not only do I have the changing of water, so I've got things like tides, I have things like waves, I have things like El Nino and whatever, but I also have, it's not just the water, it's also the air. So I have constant shifting of both air and water and the mixing of these things and still 
these are incredibly resilient structures. So if I'm looking at how the, the geology, nope, not the geology, the geometry of these things and their complexity of shapes, both above the ground, as well as their root systems, as well as things that, you know, maybe the roots and things that are in the water, like the mangroves, which make these like little nurseries for fish and they slow down all the sediment. And they kind of create these like little baskets. Like there's all sorts of cool little stuff going in there above the water. Um, right beneath the water and then deep in the earth. So we could look at all of those places, air, terrestrial, subterranean, and look for solutions there. We can also look on that interface between water and land and in coral reefs and in blue mussels, maybe they're extending into the water. So we've got a lot of variation here. So where else that's kind of water-based might we add to this? What are some other ecosystems? that may have some similar properties. I'm thinking Florida for one. What else do I have? So places like the Everglades, anytime that you have a swamp, that's gonna be a great place to look. We also see in some areas, tropical, the Amazon, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Especially when we're getting to, you know, the space where multiple tributaries and ocean connect. When I'm looking at different uh, ecosystems combining. We also see that mangroves, coral reefs and sea grasses all work together. And so you'll have like a coral reef like out at the perimeter and then you've got some sea grasses and then you've got some mangroves. And so like these three things will work in tandem. So like these might take on the strongest winds and then these are making, you know, spaces for like the intertidal flow. And so it's not just one ecosystem doing all, all of the things. When we zoom back, it's multiple ecosystems that are working together as sea barriers and niches and you know micro habitats and all this stuff too. <clears throat> so that brings me to the next thing. And I mentioned this already, but in you know for your final project, as you are thinking about what you might want to emulate to make you know pieces of the city for the future where we could live where we want to live and create habitats and create materials or you know you can look at the material you can look all the way up to like a huge structure so we've got these three different levels of emulation one we can look at the process of making the material itself so how does the coral reef or any of my like crab decapod mollusk shell creatures how do they make that skeleton how are they where are they making it out of uh what are they using that's already dissolved in that water in the case of the mussels, how are they making the adhesive itself? So the ingredients, the operating conditions, how do we make the thing? Then we have the emulation of the material itself and its properties. So again, when we saw the blue mussel, it's like it gets in contact with water and it gets harder instead of more gelatinous, which it, like I can't even imagine throwing something in water and having it like become tougher than floss. Like that's so alien to our designs. Yet it's super stretchy. So all these different properties that relate to engineering challenges based on the materials properties, boom, that's something that we can look at. So we might not, and if, you, if you're one of the people who you sign up for this um, case study, you know, you might not be <clears throat> using all of the things that we talked about, and we're probably not going to directly use the muscles, right? We're going to think about how are they making it? How are we, we recreating it? And maybe we're using a different material that can do some of the same things because we don't want to do bioutilization here. And then again, we can go much larger. Instead of the process, instead of the material, we can look at the entire geometry or the shape of the thing. How big is it? Maybe it's something super tiny. Maybe it's you know really localized, like one little sort of basket of stilted roots. Um, maybe it's huge. Maybe there's multiple ecosystems that's really big that work in tandem with each other. Um, and here we're really also thinking about like all the ecosystem services. So not only am I slowing down the water, but I'm promoting biodiversity because I have all these niches. Um, I'm cleaning the water as well. We know that uh, 
uh, mussels and oysters and all these other organisms are filter feeders. And so they clean the water as things go by. All of that stuff is something that you could consider. So when we first got into this week, I said, you know, before we think about the rebuild, we have to keep in mind that as the electricity fails, then we have raw sewage everywhere. Our water is contaminated everywhere. So thinking about something like a mussel where for the rebuild, I might have some adhesive properties. Ooh, but maybe I could think about that on a large scale. What if I had houses or buildings that kind of took this idea on a larger scale? And what if they could also filter and clean the water at the same time? Like multifunctionality is the name of the game. So I'm just throwing some ideas out there for you to think about. Now, this gets me into my sort of very last uh, big point here. Last week, I said, all right, let's go into the lit. And let's get all the way to the primary lit and let's dig around and see if we can find something. Why do we need primary lit to do biomimetic work? Why do I ask you to go all the way down there? Think about your client. If you are a biomimic and your client comes to you and they say, all right, I've got this function around attachment. And right now we're using, you know, I beams and rebar and it's oxidizing and that's a problem. And we've got all these like, you know, uh, foundations that are all separate from each other, like Legos. And so all of our buildings can kind of fall over separately and they're not attached. Da, 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 da. If you are trying to get them to buy in to looking at nature. Credibility, exactly. You need to be able to point to something and say, here's the data. Here's how I know that this works. If it's something that hasn't already been like prototyped, people wanna know that the risk that they're taking isn't so risky. So this idea, as Aaron points out, of credibility, amazingly, amazingly, incredibly, important. You throw some data at the engineers and they're like, oh, oh, okay. I can make sense of this now. They need to know that it works. Now for us and for them, we have to then, you know, we're usually going to start with the secondary and the tertiary lit so that we can find the organisms using our keywords, learn about them, building our background knowledge. And you know, all of us are going to have different backgrounds. Some of you guys are bio nerds like me. Some of you guys are engineers. We're sustainability. We run the gamut. So we start with the easy stuff to build our things up. And then those stories can also be the stories that you pitch to your clients. So it's like you get the emotional, really interesting stuff from the secondary and the tertiary lit because there is nothing more powerful than storytelling. And then you get some of those people in the door who are like, yes, I'm connected to nature. I love nature. I love hiking. I love this idea of reconnecting with nature. I want to be someone involved in quote unquote, saving the planet. You're going to get some of those people on board and they're going to be like, wow, but not everybody's like that. Some people want something realistic and some people are thinking about profit. So you have to then go to what is the primary lit and how can I see that this works um, so that those people get the buy-in too. So all of these organisms that we've mentioned from coral reefs, these are actually um, butterfly scales, uh, Fibonacci sequences and spirals. You know, all of these things, everything in nature can restore. And by having you search for a case study, this is what I want you to look for. I want you to look for places where biomimicry works, that it's a prototype that we've gotten that data from and we're maybe making a new research paper saying we made this thing and here's my data and we're going to link you back to the primary um, research that talks about the structure and the function we use that to make this innovation here's the data that we got out of there and here's a new you know example of primary lit you are looking for what is already working you are looking for those stories of inspiration so that when you talk about this stuff to other people, 
you've got some stories in your head already. So you can say like, this works and it's beyond sustainable. It's net positive. It's not neutral. It's positive. So like, this is what I said, like in the first week that this biomimetic work gives me just a ton of hope. Because if we're learning from nature to be part of the solution, then we can create healing instead of just healing ourselves and we can give back. Um, so like, what would it look like? What would it look like if all of our structures were this beautiful and promoted this amount of diversity and cleaned the air and cleaned the water and made life more equitable for everybody? You know, like every single one of these organisms has something to teach us. So that's your, that's your goal for Sunday is finding the case study, finding the story that provides hope. So with that, let's go back to what your assignment actually is. I'll walk you through that real quick and then you can sign up. 